Perfect. Wonderful. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for jumping on here with us this evening. Uh, we've got uh, an incredible collection of faculty here this evening to discuss their experience on hind foot fusion strategies, research, and the P28 suite of solutions that's available to address these fusion cases. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Jim Edson. I'm our Vice President of Downstream Marketing. Just a few notes on the call tonight. Uh, this is really intended to be interactive, so please take advantage of these experts that are on the on the call with us. Type in your questions in that sidebar. Um, for those of you from Paragon 28, if you want to text them to me, I can make sure that we address those. Um, obviously, we'll have a question and answer session that immediately follows the presentations this evening. So I'm really thrilled to have guest lecturers, Dr. David Thorson, Dr. Mark Meyerson, Dr. Mark Easley, and Dr. Teus Patel joining us this evening to share their experience with these complex cases and development and usage of these technologies. They've all put in a lot of these implants. That's part of the reason I wanted to have them on here this evening. Dr. Meyerson's gonna start us off with an introduction to hind foot fusion strategies and some research related to ankle and pantalar fusions. He's then gonna provide the design rationale for the silverback plating system, which he aided in the design of uh, and introduce some of the novel aspects of this technology which is really intended to provide surgeons precision placement of plate and screws um, and discuss some of the recent offerings that we've added to the system. Uh, Dr. Easley will share his experience with these fusions in detail why he's integrated the silverback system into his practice. Dr. Thorderson and Dr. Patel will bring it home this evening with an introduction to our phantom nailing system, detail some of the design rationale for that and discuss some of the cases uh, where, they've used the, where they've used this product. Gentlemen, thank you for your willingness to tackle these topics this evening. Uh, Dr. Meyerson, I'll go ahead and let you take it away. Very good. I'm going to share my screen. And here we go. All right, everybody. So uh, very nice to see you all. And I'm going to go over my, uh, my experience with... Uh, have I... Let me just... Um, Am I in um, full? No, I'm not. No, you're not. Nope. There we go. Okay. So Perfect. I'm going to go over a little bit about my experience and uh, particularly some of the design rationale issues for this, uh, just to let you all know that I'm one of the designers uh, of the plates that will be presented uh, in this talk. So, you know, the, the background to all of this is, is important to understand because when we got started with uh, thinking conceptually about arthrodesis and what to, what to have as part of the plating system. We recognize that what we wanted was a family of plates. Um, we did not want an ankle fusion plate. We wanted different types of ankle fusion plates. We didn't want a TTC plate. We wanted to be able to approach this as a primary or revision strategy, or even combined with um, a custom additive cage. All of these things came into consideration in the planning, and I, I'm going to try to share this with you. Now, of course, um, the first thing that we have to decide is, uh, are we going to do an ankle or TTC arthrodesis and why? So let me take you through an algorithm before we get to the actual design rationale. If the bone quality is good, generally we'll do an isolated ankle arthrodesis as something you see here. If the bone quality is bad, of course you can continue still doing an ankle arthrodesis, but generally a TTC would be preferred as you see in this patient with rheumatoid arthritis. When we are having realignment issues, if it's possible, we'll do an ankle arthrodesis, something like this. Now, this, of course, is a little challenging, but um, if it, you can see here that realignment was obtained in the AP projection, but not really laterally where you, your foot is still a little bit anteriorly translated, and perhaps a TTC might have been better. If uh, realignment is not possible, well, then a TTC arthrodesis, as you see there, is going to be performed. What about avascular necrosis? Well, if it's patchy, an ankle arthrodesis can easily be performed. And you see a very min minor case of uh, AVN. And if it's bad, we're going to consider a TTC arthrodesis, as you see here. 
Now, the other uh, issue is what about if it's really bad? Uh, what are we going to do there? Uh, because you can do a tibiocalcaneal arthrodesis and there are a number of uh, options for going about this. The one would be with a femoral head graft uh, and the other would be with an additive orthopedic cage. As uh, most of you know, uh, additive is now part of the Paragon family and it's an important consideration when you're dealing with large bone defects. Um, one of the issues, though, that I want to uh, highlight is that while uh, the, uh, the approaches, regardless of whether you do it anteriorly, laterally, and so on, with these large femoral head grafts, does have some issues, in particular non-union. Uh, we, in, in this particular paper, we found that uh, we had a 52% rate of arthrodesis. Uh, with these bulk femoral head grafts. Now, granted, in this study, there were 13 patients with diabetes, and not one of those uh, uh, healed. Uh, the total number in this series was 32. But even if you, you know, if you include the patients with diabetes, it's very low rate of arthrodesis. But still, even without them, we still had a high rate of non-union. So this is a, a, a test that you can do so that you don't have to consider a large structural allograft. Just push up on the heel onto the tibia, see what kind of apposition of bone you have. And you could consider uh, simply a TC arthrodesis with cancellous graft rather than using um, a large structural graft. So, the other issue when you do this, of course, is can you close the incision? Because remember, you start out, if you look at my hand here, you start out here, and as you, you're compressing it, the skin tends to pucker open. You need to be sure that uh, you can close the skin. Now, I'm going to cover a few other uh, aspects uh, of decision making, and that is if your subtalar joint is normal, of course, you're going to do an ankle arthrodesis. But if it's stiff, as I'll show you in some background research we've done, a TTC becomes necessary. Uh, and here you can see a patient with a stiff subtalar joint, even though there's not terribly much arthritis, we've recognized that um, a TTC should probably be done. Now, in your decision-making ankle or TTC, this is going to now uh, follow with uh, what I want to present to you here. We do know uh, historically that extension of arthritis from an ankle arthrodesis to adjacent joints uh, in this study by Charlie Salzman and his group in, originally in Iowa, uh, they found that there's a very high rate uh, of uh, adjacent joint arthritis. In my experience, the development of adjacent joint arthritis radiographically is 100%. Um, clinically, it's a lot less, but still you need to be aware of it and perhaps consider a TTC arthrodesis to begin with, because I'll raise this question to you all and we can discuss this. If you think about the rate of failure in your own practice of patients who've had an ankle arthrodesis, and have to go on to either a TTC or even a pantalar arthrodesis. It's substantial. Now consider the rate of TTC arthrodesis under similar circumstances, perhaps post-traumatic when your alignment is not all that bad. How many of those end up going on to a pantalar arthrodesis? It's not that many, and there's a biomechanical reason for it. Anyway, we, you know, back in the 1980s, what we found was if the subtalar joint is stiff, included in the arthrodesis, don't leave it alone. You can see here, of course, in the, in the 80s and through the early 90s, we used screws. Um, we, we noted in the 90s that if you have neuropathy or patients with diabetes, a TTC is invariably necessary. It's not to say that you cannot do um, an, an isolated ankle arthrodesis, in, uh, in patients with diabetes, but you're, you're far uh, safer uh, and it's more predictable to do a TTC arthrodesis. Now, here's a, a very important study because we compared and we tried to match these groups as best as possible. 
two groups of patients, one with ankle arthrodesis and one with TTC arthrodesis, looked at the patient outcomes. And there was very little clinical difference in the patient outcomes between ankle and TTC arthrodesis. Perhaps this was a little skewed and biased because of the fact that those who were uh, included for TTC arthrodesis may have had different expectations to begin with than those um, who had an isolated ankle arthrodesis, but nonetheless, uh, the scores were very, very similar. Here's another little technique, which I just want to share with you, which we use pretty much routinely, whether this is an anterior approach, lateral or posterior, and I'll try to show you another example of that later. The design rationale, uh, I've already indicated that uh, when we started discussing the um, breakdown of how we wanted to go about this plating system, um, common to all of the plates is that this is an anatomic plate, which is aligned with the precision guided system. That, that kind of takes you through every single plate, every approach, you've got access to the precision guided screw system. Now, if we look at this here uh, with screws, we're gonna go back now to 1980s, 1990s, when we started using screws for fixation. If you consider the surface area of the body of the talus, relative to these three screws. The screws, if you're using seven millimeter screws or even greater, um, occupies a large surface area. So that if you use three screws, that's 21 millimeters of surface area. That's a lot. And perhaps that has something to do with um, the outcome. Here's three screws technique. And you can see here, um, that that's, those screws occupy a large surface area. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why we should consider a plate. In fact, if you look at this study here in a meta-analysis, higher non-union rates have, have been reported with screw fixation, particularly in those with osteopenia. Now, when you're faced with a case like this, it's not to say that you have to do a TTC. You can certainly do an isolated ankle arthrodesis, but screws are out of the question. Now, the, the, the approach to this is you need to consider some sort of plating for the ankle. And what type of plate, how you're going to approach it, now brings us into uh, the, uh, the silverback um, family, because you can approach this anteriorly, laterally, or posteriorly for an isolated ankle arthrodesis. If you look at uh, this, this is a historic uh, interest only as far as I'm concerned, because this is a terrible plate. It's not designed well. If you look distally, uh, it's a batting on the talonavicular joint. Um, proximally, the plate is much too thick and is going to lead to a stress riser. And if you look at the x-ray intraoperatively carefully, there's an anterior load on the joint and it's not compressing the joint uh, correctly. You've got this huge wide open space from center to back. If you look at this here, it's the same problem. This plate is too thick causes a stress riser at the proximal tibia. Uh, and this is not that common, but it's certainly not that rare, but it's related to the thickness of the plate. There's a very poor transition in the design of a plate like this. Now here's your, your silverback anterior plate. And if you look at this carefully, there are many anatomic design features which are important. Firstly, the plate is, is no, it's not just based on the anterior plate. You've got your precision guided screw, which centers your compression right where you want it, which is in the middle of the joint. Secondly, there's a nice transition. This is an anatomic plate that contours beautifully over the ankle. The only area of the plate that's a little thicker is right where you need it. It's over the actual ankle joint. Distally, there's a nice transition over the neck of the talus so that there's no abatement distally over the uh, talonavicular joint. And proximally, it's a very thin uh, plate and there's a nice smooth transition to uh, the uh, 
uh, fixation on the proximal tibia so that you're very unlikely to have a stress reaction on the tibia. Here you can see an example of this anterior translation of the ankle relative to the tibia. And this brings us to the precision guide and how you go about this. You know, the precision guide, We, if you go back to the first um, Paragon plate, the MP Fusion plate, that precision guide made it so easy. And this is carried through every single plating system that Paragon has, including uh, your silverback. Uh, and you can see the precision guide. Most of you are familiar with this. It gives you two options for fixation uh, for your compression screw. You'll note that the center screw proximally uh, is not compressed. You can do that at the end here. But realistically, once you compress the ankle with the precision guided screw, I'm really not sure that there's terribly much advantage to compressing your plate. I, I don't think it's even necessary. Uh, but the first screw is indeed very important so that you get appropriate and adequate compression. Now, as part of the system uh, for ankle fusion and your TTC plating system, it's not just a plate. Uh, you must think of this as a system which includes everything you could possibly want, pin distractor, laminar spreaders, and your various tools that help you with uh, getting into the joint, whether it be osteotomes, curettes, and, and chisels. There are um, two size plates. Actually, there are three if we consider the, the mini plate, uh, but you've got different sizes and a flat and a contoured. Um, I'm not sure what those of you who are on the call, what you prefer to use, whether it's a flat or contour, but at least you have it. Um, not infrequently, you may have to just contour the anterior aspect of the distal tibia for the plate to fit. That depends on the extent of anterior osteophytes and the presence of arthritis. Here you will see uh, a typical example. Now, if you look there, that's where your precision guided screw goes. Now, if you look carefully on the plate, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but here as well, there's a laser line on the plate, which tells you exactly where your precision guided screw is going to go. So you know that it's um, out of the, the way of these other screws. And once you're done with your precision guided screw, you can compress it uh, if you want, proximally on the proximal plate. Anyway, there, that's what I wanted to show you. There's that laser line, which really does help you with positioning. And you know that you're going to be centered correctly. The technique, we don't need to go into very much. Uh, if you have a little bit of osteopenia with the plating system, you can use a washer for more compression. I'm not sure that it's terribly necessary. And as I've already said earlier, the, the use of an additional screw is probably not necessary. You certainly can. And if I were to use a second screw, I'd probably nowadays um, use a fully threaded screw. I don't think that a, another compression screw is necessary. You can see here the anterior translation very nicely corrected uh, with centered centering of your ankle joint and the tibia to the talus. Now, the, as I've already indicated, this is a family of ankle fusion plates so that when you have a case like this with very, very poor skin anteriorly, but a good indication for an ankle arthrodesis, you can certainly go either laterally or posteriorly because the posterior approach is also available uh, for an ankle fusion, in addition, of course, to the TTC. Um, now, I'm going to take you back a long, long time to the 1980s when I first tried arthroscopic ankle arthrodesis. And I must admit, I wasn't very good at it. And um, you know, over the decades, I was never terribly enamored with um, arthroscopic arthrodesis, although it's a, it's a fine technique if you have the skill set to do so. But what happened is that this led to the development for, for me in my own practice of the mini arthrotomy approach. The mini arthrotomy approach had tremendous advantages mm -hmm. because it offered some of the advantages of arthroscopic uh, approach just by enlarging these portals. But I, um, even though our results were, were good, um, there was still a concern, and, I, and I'm not sure whether this had to do with the three-screw technique that I used, 
um, and whether that has been circumvented by using a plate. Now, if you follow through the line of thinking, the, the minimally invasive approach, whether you do this uh, arthroscopically or open, does have a distinct advantage. And that has led to the development of a minimally invasive plating. It's ex the exact same approach that you would use, uh, but it's a tiny little incision. You can see here what this looks like, small little incision anteriorly through which you can uh, in insert the plate. Now, why is this important? Because some research was done uh, on the use of the plate comparing uh, the um, mini open technique uh, with three screw construct. And what did, uh, what did we find? Well, using the, uh, the mini plate, uh, it's far increased rigidity using the mini open technique compared to uh, three screws. The other thing that, of course, we know, and this is intuitive, is that by using the mini plate, you've got uh, a much greater surface area for your, your joint uh, to oppose. And this is what it is. I mean, you know, if you look there and you look at the surface area, this is a finite element analysis model that was done in, in that study. It, it just, it's intuitive. It makes a lot of sense that if you use an anterior plate, you're going to have more surface area available for your arthrodesis. Let's move on from the ankle to the TTC. And if you look at this historically, um, these plates don't accomplish terribly much in the, in, uh, with what we really need, uh, which is uh, fixation on the calcaneus, compression, control of rotation, and uh, anatomic alignment. So if you look at the family of TTC plates, these cover it all. Each of these is designed anatomically, along with the precision guide system and um, of the, uh, it allows you to go to the TTC anterior, lateral, and posteriorly. Now we know uh, from our work on the ankle arthrodesis that the anterior approach to the ankle with a plate works well. So why not use the exact same system for TTC? Well, it, it, it works. In fact, these whole, if you, start out with an ankle arthrodesis and for some reason you're not happy with fixation with your screw construct the the holes on your your tibia correspond exactly to the ttc plate it's a slightly different plate um, you can see here what is done is that you apply the plate you fuse the ankle and then use your precision guide to pass your first pin through the center hole, as you see on the bottom here, and then your second pin uh, is attached to your pin guide uh, outside the leg. So there you see you've got your first compression screw done, and then your guide will allow you to put your second screw. And I, as I've indicated, once you've got one screw that's in compression mode, I don't think that a second compression screw is necessary and you can use a fully threaded screw. And here's an example of that. Uh, very nice. In this particular case, two partially threaded screws uh, were used. And I, and I, I think that's fine. But um, nowadays, I would prefer to use a derotation screw as a fully threaded screw. The posterior approach is, is a very necessary approach. And I must say that uh, perhaps it's, I'm a little biased because of the type of cases that I'm doing nowadays on our humanitarian programs. These are very, very typical problems that we see where there's terrible soft tissue. And I really like the, uh, the posterior approach uh, for a TTC or even an ankle arthrodesis. Uh, Dave Thordarson, who will come on uh, uh, in a little while, he, I think it was in the 1990s. Didn't you describe a posterior approach um, for, uh, for primary arthrodesis after pilon fractures? Yeah, you got a good memory. Yeah, I was using blade plates from behind. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, this is not a, not a terribly new technique or, or approach because uh, as uh, as I just said, this has been used since the 1990s, but it's necessary. Remember, I said uh, that uh, I like to use an acetabular rema, and it gives you uh, exposure to 
both the ankle and subtalar joints, and then you can supplement that bone graft. Now, if you look at this carefully, why is this important? Because you've got your posterior approach. Uh, in most cases nowadays, I'll just cut out the Achilles tendon. So I've got a very nice approach. You don't have to. I mean, you can split it and move it. You can get into both your joints, but the reason I like to use the acetabular rema is this. If you look at this now, I, I've scalloped out with the acetabular rema a little well from the tibia all the way down to the calcaneus, which you can fill with bone graft. Now what you have is an intra-articular intra arthrodesis, but also an extra-articular arthrodesis, which is very, very important. <clears throat> right there uh, in that little circle. If you need more uh, bone graft, you can go with the, with the rema to the posterior iliac crest and you get just a huge amount of bone graft as you see in that little basin. Uh, you just open, open it up with a lamina spreader or a pin distract and pop your graft in. The, the design of the TTC uh, plate is not very different in, in concept to the ankle plate so that you'll start out with your ankle fusion first. If you look carefully on the plate here, you'll see your laser line. It's the exact same laser line for your precision guide. You can see it on the ankle. So what you'll do is you'll do your ankle, but that mark there on the red where I've circled it in red, you've, you've still got to put in your precision guided screw first. So there you see your precision guided screw. Then you can compress your ankle. The first two screws you're going to put in are into the talus. So you'll put your, your plate down, put your talus screws in, then compress it with your precision guided screw. Then you can fill up the screws onto the tibia as needed. Then again, you reverse your, your precision guide and you'll see it fits on in a different alignment. But again, there's a laser line which you can see on your plate. And it's the same uh, process where you've got there's number one, you, you compress it there, then you're going to use your guide uh, through the precision guide to fix your subtalar joint. And this is what the construct looks like when you're done. Most of you are probably more familiar with a, a lateral transfibular approach. And I, I use this when we have a varus deformity and that it makes perfect sense. If you look at this plate, it's so beautifully designed and you know, I'm a little biased, but it really is well designed. Your, your plate over the calcaneus, you've got multiple screw options for fixation of the calcaneus. And then again, uh, it's anatomic. You've got options for fixation in the talus. Uh, and of course the precision guide takes you through this step-by-step. -step. Here's another example of where I would uh, consider transfibular approach. Whether you use a, a rod or a plate, that may be a, a decision, a surgeon's choice, which we can discuss a little bit later. Um, here's a, a clinical example, which is rather interesting. This is a patient who'd had an anterior approach to the ankle, developed a non-union, as you see there, went back, uh, developed an infected non-union. Uh, unfortunately, you see the cement there, finally resolved with the lateral uh, TTC plate with a, a cage. So. That, um, you know, that brings me to the end of the talk. I think that there are many, many ways you can go about uh, using these plates, whether it's an anterior, lateral or posterior, whether it is ankle or TTC. Thank you very much. Dr. Meyerson, real quickly, there were just two questions that came through. Um, just wanted to hit these and then I think we'll jump over to Dr. Thorson. The first one had to do with you were describing, um, you know, kind of provisional fixation, in particular, I think with that anterior fusion plate. Can you walk the audience through just what the recommended steps are yeah, to ensure sure. that we get the maximize the placement of that plate? Of course. So alignment, alignment, alignment. Uh, you you want your ankle in neutral uh, in the sagittal plane, never in Aquinas. You want to control rotation. Uh, and of course, you want to control your varus valgus. Now, if you think about how you're going to go about this, let's say you're doing it anteriorly. You're going to use an anterior plate. You've done your joint preparation, your joint debridement. Now you've got to hold it in place. So what I, I like to do is to put one, even two pins in 
anterolaterally. So it will start from the anterolateral tibia, entering into the talus, hold it. That pin is going to be out of the way uh, of your, your plate and the precision guided screw, which comes in uh, from the medial side. Just bear in mind this, that you'll fix your plate on, uh, onto the tibia and talus with uh, pin guides or fast guides. And then you're going to use your precision guide medially. Before you actually compress it, uh, you want to remove that temporary alignment pin, as it were, so that it's not uh, going to minimize or decrease the amount of compression because that screw, that, that pin comes in obliquely. Yeah, perfect. Then there was one other question, and this is for the, the, the whole team here. It's just any tips for correcting anterior translation of the talus, whether you're doing an open or arthroscopic approach. Yeah, so uh, arthroscopically, it's, uh, it's quite difficult to correct that. Um, and one of the problems doing arthroscopic joint realignment is that it's not that easy to correct coronal plane alignment either. Uh, one of the problems you have to think about is this. When you've got deformity, and let's say I'm simulating now valgus deformity, this being the medial side of the ankle here, um, in order to correct your deformity back into neutral, you're going to have to do quite an extensive release laterally um, in order to get your talus to compress up into the tibia. If you've got good alignment to begin with here and it's symmetric, it's obviously much easier to do your arthroscopic debridement and arthroscopic joint preparation. The other uh, issue is that you've got to think of the, the size of the talus and the dimension of the talus. The talus is you know, shaped something like this. Now, if you want to move your talus up and you've got a little impingement medially or laterally, you've got to take that down completely in order to get your talus to abut up against the tibia for your arthroscopic procedure. And in cases like that, uh, perhaps it's preferable to do uh, an open technique, whether you do this with an extended anterior approach or using the minimally invasive plate. Perfect. Perfect. Um, that's in, I will catch you at the end here if there's any other questions, but those were the two questions that I saw that came through the chat. Um, let's see, Dr. Thorson, can you share your screen? Yeah, sure can. Perfect. Oh, you know, if, if I may just uh, say one more thing though, uh, Jim, uh, in response to tips for, for correcting that uh, translation, when the talus is anteriorly translated, the biggest problem you're going to have is posterior uh, because it's your posterior soft tissue that's really blocking you because you have to move your joint, uh, your, your talus from there all the way back. Uh, and in order to do that, you've got to use a curved osteotome to get into the back to separate your soft tissues. So that you can, in a case like that, where I've got a lot of anterior translation, I would put a laminar spreader into the joint so that I can get into the back with a curved osteotome, which is in the, in the set, so that I can debride it adequately in the back. And then you'll find it's a little looser and you can easily translate it back posteriorly. Sorry, Dave, go, go ahead. That's quite all right. I mean, my only follow-up to Mark's points are is um, I'm not a big arthroscopic fuser either, but the majority of the fusions I'm doing have pretty significant deformity. And it's just, it's really tough to do that through the scope, especially if you're not real facile with it. And the other thing is, even if you can contour the bones well, you really can't do the soft tissue releases. And oftentimes I find I really have to distract the joint to disrupt whatever's tight. You know, if it was Mark was talking about, you know, if you have valgus, you have to loosen things up laterally or immediately. And it's really challenging to do that. Uh, through the scope and then to, to start trying to put a lamina spreader into the joint through an arthroscopic portal probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense so <laughs> i'm not real big on scoping but uh and the other thing is you know honestly that i i think the reason why scoping was such a big thing was before they had the you know the good blocks you know where the patient's numb for 24 hours you could keep the patient out of the hospital you know i'd have my average patient spend a day day and a half in the hospital for pain control and then pop teal blocks came around and I don't do any inpatient surgery anymore, um, nothing. 
um, even a TTC fusion, a pantalar fusion, everything goes home the day of surgery. So those are the only points I make there. So um, I think Jim wanted me to talk for about 15 minutes. Um, I have other cases I'll show uh, later if there's time. <clears throat> um, I'm a big rotter when it comes to TTC fusions. Um, and uh, I don't have any conflicts here. <laughs> I, I didn't design any of the, the, the phantom nail or uh, any of the devices, but uh, I just, I really like uh, what they have available. Um, so hopefully this is probably actually visible, I'm guessing here. I don't want this blocking my screen and yet I have no idea how to take that out. Can you see the bar at the top or not, Jim? No, hopefully not. Anyhow, so I'm hoping you can't see if it is something can tell me how to remove the, the, the bar that's, that comes up with the zoom thing. So for, for indications, um, obviously ankle and subtalar arthritis, you wanna fuse them both if they're both symptomatic. Charcot ankle arthropathy, I will never do an isolated ankle fusion alone, even if it's just Charcot of the ankle, but that's pretty darn uncommon. Failed total ankle arthroplasty, usually by the time it fails and you're considering a fusion, there's little enough bone stock left that it's pretty challenging to do just an ankle fusion alone, although I have one I did just recently, and of course, then I just used one of the uh, anterior plates that we were just looking at previously with Mark. AVM with collapse, you, you got to do a TTC fusion because there's really no viable bone left in the talus and some of the more complex uh, deformities. Um, so for these, again, my personal preference is fusing the ankle and subtalar joint of the rod. And the primary reason for that is it is a load sharing device. Um, I, you know, the plates, you can get compression, you put your oblique compression screw in, but you really don't get ongoing compression. Um, and in particular, when you use you know, your, your dynamic screws up proximally. Uh, obviously, I bone graft, there's defects. Um, I personally I don't go the LA crest anymore. Uh, certainly, it's the gold standard, but I've had very good luck using an graft and you know, some of the uh, BMP2. So I very, very rarely go. If I don't need a lot of bone graft, you know, I'll use local bone graft. I've actually recently, because it's a big thing with our trauma people have been using the RIA um, for bone graft and it's pretty easy to get that out of the uh, femur from uh, the knee joint. Um, <clears throat> I almost invariably do a lateral transfibular approach because you need to be able to get to both the ankle and subtalar joints. If you make an anterior approach, you're gonna have to make a separate sinus tarsi incision anyhow to get access to subtalar joints. So I almost invariably go transfibular and then you can also use the tip of your fibula for bone graft. Um, basically, I've never been converting a TTC fusion to a total ankle replacement. Um, so, and there's probably not a lot of indications. I've only done two takedowns so far in my career, one of which was a non-union of an ankle fusion, which is, you know, I haven't really burned any bridges with regard to your bone stock. Um, I invariably, I used to, you know, line these things up, uh, you know, with fluoro shots and putting something radio dense with the lateral side of the foot. But by, bottom line is I just always make my incision on the anterior edge of the heel pad and it works. You don't have to line it up. You just know if you're on the anterior edge of the um, heel pad, you can, you're, you're gonna be, get, be able to line it up with the tibial intermedullary canal. Um, I make a transverse incision. I do not make a longitudinal incision because the, the, the structures at risk are obviously your lateral plantar or artery and nerve. And if you make a, a longitudinal incision, you're gonna get into the weight bearing surface, the heel pad, number one. Number two, the distal aspect of your scar is gonna start getting up against the nerve and artery. If you make a transverse incision, you can pretty much just stick your knife straight down to bone, tra uh, transecting the plantar fascia on that lateral side, and then kind of work around that. I don't cut all the way transversely down to, to the bone, but you can get down safely laterally without um, damaging the artery or the nerve. Now, one of the things I think is really important that I really like with the uh, phantom nail is um, I like a straight nail, <clears throat> but if you have, unless you translate your foot significantly immediately, your, your, your calcaneus won't line up with the tibia. So I'm gonna try to show you on a couple of slides later. Um, if you use a straight rod and you don't have the ability to bend the tip of the nail when it's turning that corner going up the intermedial canal, you've got your entry point is gonna to have to be medially, and then you're running the, the risk of your, your rod cutting out uh, through the medial cortex, the, the calcaneus or your posterior anterior screws not getting as much uh, purchase as you'd like. Um, I go dead center uh, when I put the, when I, for my starting point with a phantom nail, because 
when you put it up, if it's when the tip of the rod starts to butt the uh, metaphyseal diaphyseal transition, it'll it'll bend up there, and you can get it to turn the corner without having to cheat your starting point way medial, or without having to do a ton of translation. I, I mean, I do translate them a little bit medially, but typically you don't have to go way medial. It, it allows it me to go way more centrally and not have to worry about cutting out. So. Um, now here's an example. The reason why I showed this one is this is a, an older case and fortunately it's successfully healed. This is a patient with AVN, but this is a straight rod. This is a this is an old Versinel, but you look here. So since I put this thing up straight, I, I overdrew the, uh, the calcaneal wall here. You can see I was actually right at the junction of where the calcaneus falls off here. Fortunately, that none of the screws cut out, it worked, but anytime you're putting a straight rod up, if you start way you know on the medial side so as not to you know to miss the tibia approximately you have to be very careful about that uh failed toe anchor replacements as i mentioned you know with the current prostheses you know that are available typically the first failure you can just put another prosthesis in if you just use a flat cut talus and a, a stemmed uh tibial component you, you can just use off the shelf you know device like an inbone to, to salvage a total ankle with the current ones, they don't, you don't destroy that much bone, but if you're thinking you have to fuse somebody after an anchor, a failed anchor replacement, there's usually a big defect. You've got virtually no um, Taylor bone stock left. So you really can't just fuse the ankle joint. Um, I personally just shorten them a bit and then I fill the gap in. I don't use structural bone graft. Um, I know Mark showed a case of that. I had a couple of failures of that and I just said, forget it. Um, I just allow them to be a little bit shorter and they, they seem to fuse more readily, more rapidly. Um, I did do a few with rods through, uh, through a cage. I think it does give a little more length stability uh, without having to use a massive allograft. Um, but again, I've had one fail with that. So I'm not 100% convinced that that's the best way to do it either. Um, after TTC fusion, I just, it's typical just with any fusion, just go six weeks, non-weight bearing, six weeks in a cast. Obviously a shark to arthropathy, it's going to be longer. Um, I typically remove the cast to make them full weight bearing when they can uh, do it without pain and they transition eventually to the shoe. And I just, uh, I think most of the patients do actually feel better for their day-to-day -day shoes. Use some kind of rocker uh, with TTC. A TTC fusion obviously is going to be a little bit stiffer than an ankle fusion alone. So what about the phantom nail? So I, I've been using this for a couple of years now. I don't know exactly what I have to put in, probably 30 or 40. I think I saw Blair's name on the call. He could probably tell you the exact number, but um, I really do uh, like the uh, device. And there are certain cases like this one. I just don't think you can um, use a, um, a an ankle fusion plate, I'd be concerned about it just because there's so much bone missing here. So this one, I used an ankle, a TTC rod and the patient actually did have an irritable subtalar joint also. Massively translated anteriorly, as you can see here. So uh, I did a TTC uh, fusion in this case and I move. So a um, couple of key points. So you, you find that Again, I just made this incision here on the anterior edge of the heel pad. I did not have to line this up fluoroscopically. When you prep the joint surfaces, you're gonna strip a lot around the back and the front, and then it makes it relatively easy. I mean, you, you do literally put the, the leg up on a bump posteriorly and just push the foot posteriorly. You get this thing to line up just right. Um, I always use, um, I'll, there'll probably be a case where I don't, but I've never not used uh, two proximal dynamic locking screws. You see here that compress the heck out of it with the compression things. So you put your rod in, you get your posterior uh, to, to enter a calcaneal screw in. Then I'll smack the impactor a few times. So I get a little bit of manual impaction already. So this is a really important technique. So you want to get your maximum compression you can. So then I've already compressed this thing. So I got my distal interlock screw in. Then I put my two proximal interlocking screws in and then I can press it. And you can see here that because I'd already manually impacted the thing with a mallet, uh, if you look at the, the, the amount, this washer, the compression washer on the inside, I probably only got about another two millimeters or so. And then it was just 
super tight and then uh, put the subtalar screw in. And you can see you're actually, this wasn't put in from the back and countersunk three centimeters. The, the calcaneal, the subtalar screw does tend to come in from the side sometimes. You can see it over on, on the AP view, but this um, really leads to a tremendous amount of compression. And um, I, when I put the rod in, it, it's basically centered here and this is right dead center. So it really is uh, nice. So here's another patient. This is a guy, um, his subtalar joint you can see here is arthritic. He was symptomatic. So um, he had a miserable failure. This is uh, just getting back to what Mark was talking about earlier. This is a miserable little plate. Um, I do believe this is a design plate for ankle fusion, but for crying out loud, I mean, maybe it wasn't. I mean, I don't know what this thing is. I mean, I, I took it out. Obviously I didn't put the thing in, but you know, two screws proximal, one distal with two screws across, and they, it was basically fixed, distracted. So this thing, unfortunately, didn't have a chance of fusing. So I saw the immediate post-operative films. They looked like this from the get-go. So since the subtalar joint was irritable, it made it easy decision-making from my perspective. I just want to go ahead and do an ankle and a subtalar fusion. So you can see here, and, and here, you know, when I was putting it in, yeah, you know, I put the ankle and, and Clinically, it looks a little dorsiflexed here, the ankle, but actually the transverse tarsal is so mobile in this patient, they're very happy with the position. But notice that rod tip can bend a little bit and keep you centered. So you, it, it'll accommodate for small, um, small, you know, being a little bit off. You can, you can compensate for that with, because the tip of the rod's flexible and you can see great bony fusion, both the ankle and subtalar joint. Um, I didn't actually have to compress that much here because again, I manually unpacked it and the bone was so hard and we properly prepared the joint surfaces that I probably got about a millimeter of additional compression down here. But notice that when I let the patient start bearing weight at six weeks, you know, we had another three or four millimeters of impaction that could have happened had that been necessary to get the joint to fuse up. Now, here's another one. Uh, this patient is a miserable failure. Um, the ankle is fused in the distant past. An attempt to convert this to a pan tailor was made. And Unfortunately, I don't have a clinical photo, but I think you can appreciate the calcaneus is often about 40 degrees or so of valgus. He is a bit insensate also. So it's like, okay, this guy's a setup for Charcot. He's not really a Charcot yet. He just was pantalar arthritis, but I want to get him straight. But then again, we also have this failed, uh, the transverse tarsal component of the pantalar conversion. So, um, and again, this is just showing where that heel is out in left field here. So in this one, oh, here's the AP view of the foot. So I need to say that the tail of Vicar fusion, I, I, the, the CC, uh, CC joined up and fused previously, but this had fallen off completely. So it was clearly a non-union, both on you know, plain radiographs and CT scans. So got this guy cranked back under. I just did this two weeks ago. Uh, his wounds have healed up, I can tell you that much. But was very happy because he got great compression. The heel took the heel from out of, you know, out of 40 degrees of valgus. He's about... About 15 now. I couldn't pull them all the way out because I already have a little tiny defect over here in the wound skin incision just because it was, it was I stretched them too much. And I actually ran a beaming screw right down the medial column. You couldn't really feel the forefoot anyhow. So I wanted something just traversing that whole thing and it failed miserably the plates previously. Um, you can see him lined up here. So at least his foot's reattached in a straight fashion. Uh, another one, <clears throat> ankle arthritis. Uh, fusion in uh, 2021 went on to a delayed union, non-union. Of course, now here, his subtalar joints are arthritic, his heels way off in valgus. Again, I want a straight rod that I can put in there to force that foot to stay straight. Oh, and a little added bonus, he has an evicular stress fracture. So uh, went ahead and did a CTC fusion. Again, you see just a little bit of compression here, dynamic locks here, put a um, a compression stable dorsally and he's now um, about four months out he's completely pain-free both here and here and he's consolidating and again so not a lot of compression if they've got good bone you put the dynamic screws in if you're already manually impacted it but they've worked very well um, and again 73 year old ankle fusion uh, the ankle actually healed here the subtalar fusion didn't the heel, again, is off in valgus over to here. This is your heel. It's about, again, 40 degrees of valgus. So, again, put a TTC rod in. 
worked well. He's uh, not having any pain. Um, another one failed subtalar fusion again, severe deformity. Um, oh, this is one, this is one that was um, so look, look at this. So this is really really severe heel valgus. This is actually one my partner did. So I thought it was a cool case, both because of the amount of correction that he got. So he got the heel back under. But one thing you have to be a little careful, make sure uh, if your bone's soft, you have to countersink the rod a little bit. So he didn't do that here. And then when he compressed it, the rod actually became a little prominent. Now the patient's not complaining of any heel pain. This is healed now, but notice it's almost, the tip of the rod's almost flush with the, the weight bearing surface of the calcaneus. Uh, here's a Charcot. This guy is a train wreck. This is my own patient, Charcot, uh, BMI 50, um, had basically no talus left, um, it just completely fragmented. So therefore I couldn't get a subtalar screw in. The guy was non-weight bearing. I, I was concerned about completely crushing this thing. So here he is, um, no, no oblique screw to augment this. We've already bought him out this because keep in mind that it, when it went in, it was down at the bottom of the slot, compressed him some, and here he is by 14 weeks. He's been walking on it since day one, and it's it's obviously settling, and then it goes on to, to you know fail completely. So um, this is uh, unfortunate because he completely powdered his calcaneus around this area here. So um, what I've done with him thus far is just take the rod out, stuck a bunch of BMP in there, and I didn't put his X-rays in from this week. But he's actually starting to heal up the calcaneus fracture. His foot's plantar grade. The guy's happy, but anyhow, just bit of a train wreck. So anyhow, so TTC fusion, obviously a salvage surgery. Um, however, as Mark pointed out, you preserve that transverse tarsal joint. It's uncommon to require conversion to, to pantalar fusion. While a little bit stiffer than an ankle fusion alone, they function very well. Uh, the iron rods low cheering, so it's great because they can get some compression even when they start bearing weight instead of using screws alone. And the phantom nail is great because it allows that central insertion point on the calcaneus rather than having to cheat way medially and run the risk of, uh, of uh, cutting out their meeting. So that's it. Thank you, Dr. Thorderson. That was awesome. Um, I hadn't seen all those cases that you've done. So uh, this is this. Thank you for sharing. I'm going to do this. I'm going to hold off on questions until we finish with Dr. Patel's presentation. Dr. Patel, can you share your screen? There we go. We can see it. Thank you. Uh, are you seeing the uh, presentation mode, like uh, the slides? Or yeah, we're seeing it in presenter modes. So I think you're not quite full screen. There you go. I have two monitors on my work computer. Kind of, yeah. give me one I, I think if you go up to display settings up there at the top, you can change it so that it shows a little different. Yeah. How about now? Is that... Uh... Yeah, we're still seeing the just the pre presenter. Yeah, just the slides and on the left side. Yep. That switch. There you go. Okay. Got it. All right. Um, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna touch upon the uh, active core nail a bit more. Um, I'm not. I'm gonna kind of go through certain slides, which I think Dr. Uh, Meyerson and Jordson have covered. Um, Kind of the basic concepts of some of some of those uh, slides, and then um, I'll show some cases at the end as well. Um, I think Dr. Myerson went through the, uh, the the rationale for nailing in general, uh, and with and Dr. Thorson went through it fairly reasonably uh, well. Um, but uh, you know, first started being used in the mid '90s. Um, Got, or at least become, became more popularized in the mid 90s with various permutations, the original ones being more of a uh, static load bearing device. Um, as, as various permutations of the nail uh, came about, 
um, when you know they included some angled nails um, with that five degree valgus bend, uh, passive compression, and then now getting into more of the fourth generation implants with active compression, um, trying to trying to maintain compression uh, with with bone loss. Um, um, so that uh, hopefully improving uh, fusion rates, uh, particularly in high risk patients. Um, our, our indications for using the Heinsberg fusion nail has, has increased, uh, I think, significantly since, since it was originally described. And, uh, you know, we use a primary arthritic changes, rheumatoid, Charcot disease, complex foot deformities, acquired congenital deformities, fractures. Um, now um, even being used as uh, uh, you know for primary fusions of pilons as well um, or or uh, in in uh, neuropathic ankle fractures that are pretty bad um, and in cases of limb salvage with significant bone loss the the results overall have been fairly good if you look at a lot of the uh, um, studies um, over, you know, eight, most of the studies are showing over 80% fusion rates, but still not 100%. Um, I guess there are a couple of studies from 100% fusion rates, but uh, I think if you look at more of the uh, uh, big reviews, it's, it's probably closer somewhere around 80. Um, and, and the satisfaction rates tend to be in the mid to upper 80s as well in, a, in many of these studies. Um, they're not without complications, um, kind of a, a systematic review up to a 55.7% uh, comp uh, complication rate, um, in, in, uh, this particular study. And, um, this is, uh, uh Han's study. And a lot of their, uh, complications were due to what they call metal work. So prominent hardware, broken hardware, irritations from the hardware. Um, then also non-unions and infections also being a significant cause of uh, complications. Uh, I certainly had issues with all three uh, personally. And um, reoperation rate was about 22%. So, you know, even though we have overall fairly good results with nailing, I think, you know, there's certainly some room for improvements. Um, and some of those improvements, I think, you know, you can try, some of it's also obviously a uh, uh, technique dependent on the surgeon, but perhaps the implant design can also help us avoid some of these uh, complications. Um, goals of TTC nailing, we touched on that alignment is the main thing, getting stable fixation, successful arthrodesis, minimizing complications. Um, this is a diagram of the active core nail. Um, the, the, the flexible foil tip that's been mentioned previously helped um, with the uh, placement within the tibia, um, also uh, hopefully prevent some uh, uh, stress risers arising at, at the tip of the nail. Um, the big 7.2 calcaneal uh, fully threaded pegs, I think, you know, better for for uh, bone uh, uh, fixation in the calcaneal bone. And then the other thing that I have used on occasion is also this 18 degree variability in the pitch of the uh, calcaneal peg. Um, I have a couple of cases where I think just I felt like you, you know changing the angle just a touch, I got more more uh, uh, fixation within the calcaneus uh, without going into the subtalar joint. Um, and then the big thing with the active core nail is this inner inner. Uh, tensioning device um, and um, uh, we'll go into that I think there's we have a little diagram in a little, uh, coming up that explains that a little bit more um, one thing that the active core nail does is allows up to eight millimeters of, of uh, translation or compression so you can maintain compression even with bone absorption up to hopefully up to eight, eight millimeters um, Kind of touched on this already. This is a diagram of the um, active core, um, the internal uh, kind of compression device. Um, so essentially, there's this inner sleeve um, that is held in a tension position. So it's essentially translated distally, and it's held there by the tension screw. 
And so once you put your uh, uh, calcaneal pegs in, and, and I kind of use a technique similar to Dr. Thornton's, I'll put in my calcaneal pegs in first. With the jig still on, I'll take a mallet and, 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 and drive it in more proximal within the tibia, trying to get sort of a gross compression at that point. And then I'll lock my um, proximal pegs in and then release the, the, the tension screw engaging the uh, active core device. And once you release that tension screw, uh, it releases the uh, spring up top, uh, the coil up top. And as that releases, it drives that inner core proximally. Um, and, it, and since it's a coiled spring, it sort of maintains that tension um, as, long as, as long as you don't exceed that eight millimeters of translation. Um, so you get a constant compression throughout the beat cycle through the subterior and to the anterior joint. Um, you know, comparing static nails versus the internal kind of compression devices, this is more of the third generation where we're just taking a screw and in, in, in compressing through the nail. There aren't a lot of studies I could find kind of comparing the two. This was one of them. It seems to indicate that uh, doing at least static internal compression does increase fusion rates um, and, and decrease time to fusion. Um, so this is a number of days um, going from 104 to 92. And then um, in the setting of diabetes, they did, you know, they did not uh, find that the, uh, uh, the fusion rate of the subtalar joint made much of a difference. They did have a higher tibiotalar. Um, this is um, using a uh, um, different company, but at least uh, kind of demonstrating a, a, a constant compression type device or active compression. Um, there was a trend towards uh, a statistically significant uh, uh, union rates, um, uh, but uh, didn't, didn't, did not, it was not statistically significant. So, um, uh, but they did note in the study, this is actually with Dr. Usually and how to do. Um, but they did note in their study that they used the active kind of compression nail um, in, in higher risk patients, uh, smokers, uh, multiple surgeries, bone loss. Um, so there may have been some inherent bias um, due to the, the patient selection. This is a video uh, demonstrating the active compression. Um, I thought it was kind of neat just to kind of see a little, little uh, video of how, how that uh, inner sleeve device uh, works. It's just a, I think a minute and a half long. So the nail goes in, put in your uh, calcaneal pegs. And at that point, I will, will uh, mallet the nail in further to get some gross compression. And as the uh, tensioning screw is released, the, the coil releases, putting tension um, on the calcaneal pegs, uh, driving them more proximal, providing uh, constant joint compression. Um, this is the, the jig, precise uh, precision uh, guide jig. I just kind of put it up there. I think it, it can be a nice tool. I, I tend not to use it much, to be honest. Um, I'll, uh, I'll kind of line everything up. Uh, put uh, pin things in place and then, and then put my guide up. But uh, having trouble getting the starting point, I think it could be helpful. Um, this is a little bit wider uh, reamer through the talus. So you do want to make sure the wider or uh, through the talus and the, the tibia. So you want to make sure that the wider part of this entry reamer does go into the tibia some so you don't kind of drive the nail in. Uh, or drive it into the tibia without it without it being wide enough. Um, this is uh, just to, to show the uh, calcaneal peg placement jig, um, giving you that 18 degrees of variability. Um, and like I said, I have used that on occasion. Um, one thing when I am putting in the um, calcaneal pegs, um, I will rotate the, the uh, jig so that the, the lateral arm of the jig is parallel with the lateral border of the foot. I feel like that will slightly uh, kind of 
bring the uh, pegs, uh, aim the pegs slightly lateral so you get more in towards the uh, anterior process of the calcaneus, uh, giving you the ability to get better uh, a bony purchase. Um, and then again, you know, when you're, if you're going to use the active core nail, you want to make sure you put the uh, proximal screws in the dynamic position, um, just so it does allow the, the nail to, to translate. Um, if you put it in the static position, maybe negate some of the uh, uh, compression that you get. Uh, these are uh, these are some of the cases I had. Um, I can kind of jump into them, I guess, if there aren't any particular questions at the moment. Um, but uh, this is a lady that I worked on her opposite side and um, had some issues on the opposite side with uh, non-union due to, to ABN and took a couple of surgeries to get her healed. Um, so when we started doing the left side, um, I, I opted for the uh, active core nail, see if the uh, given her high risk if she uh, would, uh, would give us a better uh, healing, healing potential. Um, she had had a previous uh, medial malleolar fracture, had neuropathy, didn't, you know, uh, not, not great protocols. Um, these were some of the intra-op. This is, this is my intra-op lateral. Part of what I'm showing here is where the nail sort of ends. I, I think this was one of the earlier ones that I did, and I and you know, in order to get this more proximal calcaneal peg, I stopped the nail right at the bottom of the calcaneus. Um, and I think you'll see in my follow-up uh, uh, slide here. This is her um, six months post-op, so she's walking, doesn't have pain, but as that active core compression was, I think, engaging. And, and uh, providing compression through the tibiotalar and subtalar joints, you can see that the, the nail did migrate distal some, um, at least the outer, outer shell of the nail. So it was a little bit distal. Um, she doesn't really have much pain associated with it, maybe due to, to some of the neuropathy she has, but uh, that is something that uh, I try to avoid. Now you do wanna make sure this nail is countersunk uh, some, um, and, and actually the jig does have some notches in it now, they'll tell you, I think if it's uh, I think eight millimeters countersunk, so that can be helpful uh, to, to pay attention to, so you don't end up in a situation like this. Thankfully, it's turned out reasonably well for me, at least up to this point. Um, this is a patient with Charcot, um, this is actually a patient I've done um, relatively recently, I think maybe a couple of months out, two or three months out at this point. Um, referred to me um, actually by infectious disease for, you know, they, they thought he had raging osteomyelitis. Um, we did take some cultures just to double check, but the cultures were negative. He never had an open wound with the sharp coat. Um, and he completely obliterated his uh, Taylor body. Um, and um, just, you know, I, my, Dr. Myerson has certainly done a lot of work on, on the allograft reconstruction and union rates. And having read some of that, I, you know, given his history, avoided, uh, I just didn't want to use any allograft at all and just decided to opt for a tibial calcaneal fusion. Um, and did warn him that he was going to be a bit short, but we did that test where, and I actually uh, uh, will shape the, I'll, I'll prepare the, so I just took out the whole Taylor body, prepared the calcaneus here. So I got down to uh, a kind of cancellous bleeding bone, something that I felt had, you know, some healing potential. And then I took the tibia and, and um, shaped the end of the tibia to fit the calcaneus. And really the only way you can do this is with a with large medial lateral approaches. So, um, you know, transfibular uh, approach and then a medial approach as well. And I just took the medial mal off um, uh, as I was doing it and uh, did keep some of that bone um, that we put back into the articulation between the tibia and the calcaneus. 
Texas, I, I have a question, if you don't mind. It, sure. You know, what you've done here is fascinating. There, Of course, you have to take off the medial malleolus, but just to explain it to everybody here that you cannot get impaction of your tibia onto the calcaneus if your medial mal is still there. Uh, it prevents uh, translation and you, you cannot center the heel under the tibia. Um, but my, my question is, in terms of translation, um, when you put a rod in at this level, uh, right through the neck of the calcaneus, you obviously don't have much, if any, purchase. The, the rod in the calcaneus serves no purpose. And I, I, this is the same thing, uh, Dave, that you could answer is what you are obviously relying on your posterior to anterior screws, nothing else. Do you think that that is adequate given the, the position of the rod so far anteriorly? The, the only reason that I, I bring this up is that I've had a few cases where I've tried to ream from this position uh, in the neck of the calcaneus and exploded the calcaneus uh, in, in doing so. So I'm curious on your, your thoughts here. Yes. Um, so the, yes, the, I, when I put in my guide wire, I actually, I kind of, I, you know, because there's so much space, I sort of looked at the um, calcaneus, um, tried to get it straight through the net, the kind of that neck of the calcaneus centered on that. And I could kind of see it coming up through that area with the exposure. And then in all honesty, I just took that and then just translated the whole calcaneus with the K wire and moved it so that it was underneath the tibia. Um, I, it certainly is a concern where, where, um, this, could break and he's, I don't have him walking on it yet. So when I get him bearing weight on it, this, this could end up kind of coming back and really uh, uh, giving me problems. Um, and I, I was very uh, kind of meticulous. Um, one of the, one of the, with, with where these screws went through as well and trying to line it up. So I went into the anterior process of the calcaneus. Um, and I used, um, actually, in this case, I used uh, the guide wires a fair amount so through, through that jig uh, with, with, for the calcaneal peg, you can throw your guide wires in to see kind of the trajectory that it's going to be in. So what I'll do is I'll throw it through that end, the more proximal one to make sure that it's still going to be in the calcaneus. Um, and then also trying to get some sort of an AP foot view to see if it's in the anterior process as well, trying to maximize the amount of bone that I, that, 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 that we can get bony recruitment, I guess, through the fixation. But, um, you know, I think part of this was luck um, and, and I'm hoping that I'll still be lucky moving forward. <laughs> um, yeah. The, the, the alternative to this would be a frame. And I did talk to the patient about a frame because um, that would give you a lot of stability um, uh, in, in, in you know, multiple planes. And you're not re relying as much on that neck, solely on that kind of the neck of the calcaneus area for fixation. Um, but the, the patient just refused to. Um, and you know, this is him, this is a six week post-op x-ray. So it's so far being okay. Um, we'll, we'll see when he starts actually walking on it, how, how it's going to hold up. Uh, I have a, this is a failed, uh, ankle, total ankle. Um, this was, uh, this, you know, opted for the nail, you know, you can see um, on the uh, x-ray all the way to the left that the, the Taylor component has kind of subsided into the sub Taylor joint at this point. So there's not much Taylor bone stock left. So uh, once, you know, we take everything out, um, trying, to, trying to do an isolated tibial Taylor fusion, it's just not gonna work well for this particular patient. I, um, use um, 
I use iliac tricortical iliac crest a lot for for some of for for these big reconstructions. So that that is what I did. Sorry, my lights in my office are motion activated. Sorry, just give me one second. So um, on this uh, particular X-ray, the uh, tricortical iliac crest graft is on the lateral uh, aspect of the of the uh, uh, fusion here, um, and uh, there's part of the crest. I actually put a little anterior as well, and there's a little bit extra that we impacted in there. And used a combination of some concellus bone from the the pelvis as well as um, some allograft um, and uh, tried, you know, uh, again, used the angled um, guide kind of. So in this particular case, what I ended up doing was um, I initially just put the uh, more distal calcaneal screw in um, and then put in the proximal screws once I kind of lined up everything and, and bone grafted it. Then I released the tension screw to allow things to kind of tension, at least initially. And then in order to get a little bit more stability, angled the, uh, uh, put that the second um, calcaneal peg in, um, trying to catch some of that. I don't know if it'll make a difference or not, but the remnant uh, of, of the talus, uh, the bottom of the talus that was still there. I think I probably ended up translating them anteriorly during this process. So that again, that uh, is probably not an ideal situation. Um, um, but yeah. the, uh, I did have to go back and bone graft the subtalar joint, um, which I didn't, I didn't really take the nail out or anything. I just made a, a scraped out um, laterally, made a little window and, and kind of scraped out enough to get the bleeding bone and bone grafted it. And um, he actually went on to heal. Um, uh, this is in one year post-op. So he is walking around and doing reasonably well at this point. This was an infected in bone um, that uh, treated in a staged fashion. So it took everything out. This is a block of antibiotic cement um, with some beads up into the uh, uh, medullary canal of the tibia as well. And um, I, in the process of getting the stem out, I did break the anterior cortex of the tibia. So I did throw a couple of screws there to hold that to see if that healed. Um, so we treated him and then took him back. And again, I, I am a fan of iliac crest autograph. So again, use the tricortical iliac crest autograph. Um, and um, on this one, I used uh, the, the, the TTC nail, not, not that before, just a, a, a more, more traditional uh, nail with the internal compression device. Um, and uh, he, he went on to heal well. It's uh, also, and you can kind of see the, the nail kind of bending a little bit proximally as well um, at, the, at the flexible pit. Um, I think, it, you know, one of the criticisms here is I probably did blow out medially just a touch um, on that on that calcaneus. Um, um, but I think, again, it, and the other thing that I kind of realized with the, with putting in this um, the more proximal calcaneal peg it's a bit difficult to determine um, uh, when when this screw has gone in completely. I think you have to kind of go to live flow and really rotate the hind foot. Um, once this guy's swelling came down, it was actually about a year later. So it was a little bit after this x-ray. Um, uh, I've gotten a CT scan, make sure he, he healed adequately. But uh, this you could feel this uh, screw. Um, the more proximal screw on the lateral aspect of his hind foot. Um, so I'd left it a little bit proud, actually, and just we just went in and took it out, and it, it, it was fine. But uh, um, I think it, you know, with this uh, more proximal screw, since it is slightly angled, um, you do. I think it's it's beneficial to go to light fluoro and make sure you can see that it is it is in the bone. Uh, this. Let's see, I don't know if you kind of go. This was a, another kind of a disaster here. She's a 
48 year old female BMI of 52. Um, she was she had an open calcaneus and pilon fracture. Um, the original films are on the left, and then she was X fixed and referred to me. And she got to me about six weeks after her injury. And by the time she got to me, she was infected. So she was draining out of her open wound, which was lateral. So we did a debridement, uh, 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 um, antibiotic spacer, um, pinder, just to maintain some sort of alignment. Let her uh, uh, heal for for a while, and then I I ended up putting a nail in just to get her fused. For this particular lady, I used. Um, actually did not use iliac crest because the idea of getting iliac crest on somebody with a BMI of 52 was a bit daunting for me. Um, I shortened her a little bit and actually used Rhea. Um, and um, she did she did go on to heal. Um, she has a very odd looking hind foot and you can see part of her calcaneus is way out in kind of the lateral aspect, but it, she has a stable hind foot that she can walk on at this point, and it's a plantigrade great foot. Um, she sort of, uh, she, she gets into a super wide shoe, so she can make it into a shoe at this point. Um, and so, we'll, you know, I, at some point I might have to try to figure out something to do if we can get that posterior tuberosity sort of translated over a little bit, but for now we're just even a key. Okay. Let's see. I don't know. I mean, I have a few more cases I can show or other, I don't know if there, you know, uh, Dr. Thornton or Dr. Myerson had some cases or comments they wanted to make. Dr. Patel, there, this is great. Um, I was going to say we, there was a couple of questions that came through that I was hoping um, one or more of the faculty could address here. Um, let's see here. And again, for everybody on the call, if you want to type in any questions that you may have, please do. Um, this, this was a question that came in. It said, um, you know, there's, I have a surgeon, um, that really likes our TTC active Cornell. He has a diabetic overweight female with severe swelling from lymphedema that has difficulty in any non weight bearing setting. This patient really needs to weight bear as soon as possible. Uh, would any of you have recommendations in terms of fixation and potentially how quickly this patient could get back to weight bearing and walking? My, my only comment would be that <clears throat> what you want and what you ask for, <laughs> it's not going to be it's not going to be the same. I mean, if if the patient says she can't be non weight bearing, then I mean, typically I go six weeks and on weight bearing, I put a rod in, but. You have patients saying that to you beforehand, they're going to be bearing weight on it right afterwards. So you just have to go into it knowing that. So it, I guess it just depends on the quality of her bone. I mean, if she has, if you can get reasonable bone apposition at the fusion site, you put one of the intermediary rods in, there's a reasonable chance it'll actually fuse. And if not, it'll hold it straight while she develops her fibrous union and then she'll be braceable afterwards. But if she's got a to totally blown up, you know, talus or distal tibia or whatever, she's probably somebody that I would uh, have one of my partners put the <laughs> frame on her because, you know, there are certain foot plates they can put on frames. I put them on, they could bear weight theoretically right after the thing's put on. But um, I, I don't personally do frames or at least I try not to as much as I can. So I, I guess that's what I do. But if you can get reasonable apposition, it's, it's a, so much easier to manage somebody with a, a cast on and a rod in their leg than a big frame with all the pin track problems and the pins breaking and everything else, especially in a morbidly obese patient. But I don't know, if Mark, to, to ask have other uh, feelings. I would kind of echo a lot of the same. If there's a lot of, I mean, I think if you can get good bony opposition, I think the nail is, I think maybe okay. One of the things I'd really kind of figure out though is the lymphedema portion. Because the patients that I have had the most soft tissue issues with are, are chronic lymphedema patients. Um, and if they, if, you know, it is, you know, there are various degrees of it. And if somebody has, you know, I mean, if, if it's significant lymphedema, then, you know, it, it just may not be a good idea to operate on uh, at all. Um, but um, if you, 
we get good bony opposition, I think the nail, I do a fair number of frames as well. And in cases where there's bad deformity, not a lot of good bone and the patient's gonna walk on it, I do tend to go more for the, nail, uh, for the frame. And just be tell them that you'll have you'll be coming back every I don't know once a month to change out a pin because if they have lymphedema and a frame their pin sites are going to get bad. Yep. There, there was another question about patient positioning. So currently, a fellow where we have many extra hands to help reduction, et cetera, going into a practice setting with much fewer hands. Um, any advice for setup and positioning for TTC nails without an assistant? That's a loaded question because if you're talking about one of these massive BMI patients, <laughs> putting those patients lateral is just an absolute hassle. And then if you do have to access immediately, I mean, it, I mean, if you don't have a lot of hands and it's not a morbidly obese patient, you stick them lateral. And then if you need to go immediately, you just exit and rotate their hip and get access there. If it's a big patient, um, one of my partners, my junior partners, fresh out of fellowship, doesn't always have a resident with them or a fellow as a figure this, it's a shoulder scope tower and he puts a basic attraction device on there and he'll just kind of hoist up the leg periodically during the case and, and it, it lifts it up so he can get access to shoot his screws from the back or from the side or whatever he wants. So there are ways to get around that, but um, if the patient's not obese, it's just easier to stick them lateral. Um, then you don't have to then you're not farting around to have because otherwise I'm always lifting the leg up on my fells, putting the screw in from the back, and it gets me a little bit of a workout that I don't necessarily want. But uh, it's it's you know we we always have a, a bunch of spare hands, but that's exactly right. You have to plan for this if you're going to be the only person there. One of the I mean I I don't do it very often. I I have lots of resident help available or at least you know first assist assist if nothing else, but um, and I, I usually go supine, but I mean, going prone, you know, you don't have to lift the leg up if you get needle and lateral, uh, not always the ideal for an obese patient again, but um, uh, if, you can use, if you're used to that angle and working in that, in that position, um, going prone, I, I don't think it's unreasonable. Thanks. Thanks, gentlemen. There are a couple other questions here. Um, one had to do with just any pearls in terms of alignment and this is specifically relating to the nails, um, in terms of that calc and sub tailor peg to get maximum purchase. And I'm assuming this is probably with the TTC nail, not the active core nail. Anything any of you are doing to well, maximize purchase there? I think what, what Teos mentioned is, is great. I mean, you, you, if you're paralleling that lateral board of the foot, then you're, your posterior anterior calc screw will be more along in line with the medial cortex of the calcaneus. And then, then you, you can, you're not going to have your, your subtalar screw, they the, put the little outrigger guide on there to shoot your subtalar screw. And I, I've had one of those. Well, my friends had one case I showed where it looked like I countersunk the subtalar screw three centimeters. That's because I actually made the incision big enough. So I could stick my pinky finger in there. I, I just felt it's like, Jesus, this thing's still prominent and screwed and screwed and screwed and finally that thing wasn't too prominent. But as you can see, it looked like I stuck it in three centimeters, but I was just skirting the, uh, the lateral wall of the calcaneus. So that time I just wasn't careful enough and I was ever so slightly externally rotated. You rapidly lose real estate to put the subtalar screw in. I mean, the calcaneal screw, the, po the posterior calcaneal screw, it's, you kind of put it in anywhere, but you got to stick think the next step ahead and that's where I, he showed perfect a perfect way to do that to avoid that cutting out there laterally yeah i mean i think uh, for me i started using the live floor a little bit just to figure out that i think that 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 sub tailor screw can be a bit tricky i think it's nice i, I think it gives you a nice fixation uh, particularly if you're if, you know, with poor, your, your tailless bone, if you have decent tailor bone, that's some of the hardest bone in the body. So if you can get some sort of fixation in there, it's nice. But it can be a bit tricky. And I think lining up that guy, and, uh, getting kind of multiple fluoroscopic images. Can help. But the other thing to keep in mind is, remember that train wreck that I showed, I did not have the subtailor screw in 
and the guy was completely non-compliant. So he started toggling through that single screw through that posterior slot. So I think it is nice to have it in there whenever possible, but that's why I have to make sure you get the, the guide lined up properly when putting him putting them in. Can I, I'd like to just ask a question of both of you. And that is when you've got these cases with bad bone issues with alignment, to me, it, it seems far more important to have much better fixation inferiorly so that if necessary, you can dynamize this and let them weight bear, or if you anticipate that they're going to weight bear, how, how, what are the tricks that you have to ensure very good um, fixation distally? For example, the one that Texas showed going obliquely with your screw into the talus, uh, things like that. Do you have any tips? Go ahead, Tess. Yeah, so uh, I, I'll, I think I mentioned, well, I'll use the, you know, because there's that 18 degrees of variation, I will, you know, I'll uh, use the guide and I'll put the uh, guide wire in to kind of see where I'm going to be going before I actually put the screw in. Um, if I have, a, you know, if, if I'm worried about bone stock, sometimes I will go with the, uh, with the, the, just the, not the active core, but the TTC nail that has that subtalar screw that can go into the talus as well to get more uh, screw purchase. And then also being very cognizant of where that nail goes into the calcaneus. I think you're, if you're worried about bone stock and the quality of the bone, I think you have, you have really have to pay attention to where that, where your starting point is. And being like Dr. Jordson mentioned, being in the center of that calcaneus, not cutting out the medial sides, so you can really maximize. Because that medial wall of the talus or calcaneus can be strong, and, you know, tends to be more the weight bearing side. And so if you can keep the nail from penetrating that medial wall, I think it does improve the. the yeah, I just read Mark, you're exactly right. I mean, obviously, you want your the challenge to the fixation is distally because approximately. You know, you put an interlocking screw, but the thing's going to be sliding up there anyhow. The rod can settle up there, so you don't need rigid fixation proximally. Uh, you obviously you want your rod to have some intermedial fit, but I think one of the keys is make sure you don't put your calc screw in too short. You know, I, I, I always have that thing more or less abutting the, the CC joint because otherwise, you know, you're not getting your full purchase, but otherwise... And you have a screw that's anywhere from 60 to 75 millimeters long. That's a nice big grab of pretty solid calcaneus. And then ideally you get something in that, that oblique screw to grab the, the tails also. And those, those are round, that's a round hole. So when you stick that screw across the, uh, the subtalar joint, you know, you've already compressed it, but even if you don't get great fixation, like that one I showed um, where I kind of <laughs> had to keep screwing it in further and further, I got the talus on that and I had purchased, so to speak, in the rod. So it was still gonna give me some added like rotational stability and I, I got my compressive stability. So I, I think that's the key. You really do wanna get both of them though. You wanna get both those two screws down below. There's no, there's no disadvantage of, in these cases of putting a screw all the way into the cuboid, the talus or even the navicular. Um, I think the, the trick there is rotation. So how you rotate your alignment um, so that you get your screw into the direct, um, to the correct plane and projection. Right, but obviously in Charcot, yeah. <laughs> if I'm doing a Charcot, sometimes my, my poster to answer screws are 110 millimeters long. So yeah, I'm running right across the CC joints. I grab the cuboid also. There was, there was one additional question that came in, and this is probably going to be somewhat variable, but um, bear with me here. Just in terms of weight-bearing protocol post-operatively for patients that you're nailing, any recommendations on that or kind of anything that's, that's maybe a typical range? I, my general rule of thumb is six weeks non-weight-bearing, six weeks in a, in a boot, uh, you know, bearing weight the second six weeks, but you know, the thing is, you always have to question are your patients compliant. I mean, I have patients come in for their 12 week appointment, they're not wearing their boot. And I mean, you tell the patients they're non weight bearing, they come in with their first post op splint, and the bottom it's all dirty and worn out because they've been walking on their foot. So um, I think ideally that's what I aim for. 
I mean, some people though, if you talk to some of the purists, it's like, oh no, I won't let them walk on it till I get a CT scan showing some bone bridging the the, the, the joint, you know, the, the ankle and subtalar joint. I don't go that far. I still don't get routine CT scans. A lot of people do it. Certainly I wouldn't uh, fault them for that, but it's just, it's if it, unless it's a Medicare patient, you got the hassle of getting it authorized, um, which typically then means a separate visit and all that. But uh, you know, purists will say no, no weight bearing until the, the CT shows fusion. I I don't agree with that. I think weight there's a there's a huge advantage of weight bearing. If you wait uh, too long, there's they become osteopenic and right. I think that weight bearing is a huge advantage. You know, I have a, I have a question. Uh, this is, I'm going to direct this to you, Texas, because you showed a lot of cases using the phantom nail. When do you use a plate and, and why? The, so for, for TTC fusions or, or yeah, TT, only TTC. Um, I mean, I, 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 my preference is, is a plate. Uh, you obviously have a preference for a nail. Why? Um, the I, I just feel like with the uh, I do I've used this plate a few times, and the people that I will use the plate on are people who have fairly good bone stock with uh, with uh, um, not a lot of comorbidities such as diabetes and and, and you know and such. Unfortunately, in my practice, I don't get a lot of that anymore. Um, and so I actually, over time, have started using the nail more and more. Um, I just feel like with the load sharing uh, uh, capacity of the nail and particularly, you know, I think at, you know, I just sometimes I just feel like the compression you get with the nail is a little bit better as well. Um, um, maybe because you're going in line with the axis of, 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 of the, of the uh, uh, intramedullary canal. Um, but those, those are, the main thing is just the quality of the bone. And I just feel like with the nail, you have a little bit of that load sharing that it's going to hold up better. Um, plus, I feel like particularly the diabetics, like with who have Charcot and, and neuropathy, they're not going to be completely compliant. They just can't. You know, they have vision issues, they have balance issues. They're going to be putting some weight on it. And I feel like if I have the nail and it's load sharing, and it, it, it maybe it makes me feel a little bit better than more than anything else. But uh, I feel like it just holds up a little bit better. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, gentlemen, I, I don't see any other questions coming in. I haven't gotten any texts, and we're already to 640 here Mountain Time. Um, I, I think I'm going to go ahead and stop it here unless any of you had some closing remarks. Not particular. I, I, I just I, – I love the phantom nail. That's what I use. Um, I love that central insertion point. And, again, I wish we were getting royalties. If you want to start sending them some royalties my way, Jim, that's fine. But, no, it's <laughs> – it's a good device, it really. Don't is. we all? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good device. Yeah. Thank you for that, um, Dr. Meyerson, Dr. Patel, Dr. Thordeson. Thank you for all your time this evening. This was great um, for everybody on the call. I will have the recording up on meded.com, so p28meded.com tomorrow. Um, we have another one of these calls scheduled for next week, same time, uh, same place. So. Uh, gentlemen, thanks for your time this evening. Have a wonderful rest of the week. And for everybody else, um, thanks for sticking around with us this evening. This was, this was a fantastic talk. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.